Are you mindful of the things of God or are you mindful of the things of men? It's extremely important that we understand that the example that we have from what Peter said to Jesus brings us to the conclusion that even a disciple, even a follower of Christ, even a Christian, without being careful, can become the mouthpiece of Satan himself. Shalom from the region of Caesarea Philippi. We're 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. We're right on the Lebanese border. We're very close to what used to be the Israeli-Syrian border until 1967. And we're in one of the most toured site in Israel. We're in the foothills of Mount Hermon, the highest mountain of Israel that is nearly 10,000 foot high. Mount Hermon is not only the highest mountain, but it's also known as a sponge that has tons of holes in it. It's a phenomena called karst, K-A-R-S-T. This is when the oxygen that comes out of the plants is basically melting the limestone and creating some holes and spaces. And once rain and snow falls, it's not just flowing above the mountain, but it is actually flowing through the mountain. And eventually the water will pop out of the ground below the mountain. And this is exactly where we are right now. We are next to the Hermon Spring, known also as Banyas. Now probably a lot of people are asking what Banyas has to do with Hermon. Well, you're right. The name Banyas is an Arabic name that was driven from the Greek one, Panias. And Panias is the worship place of Pan. And that is the thing that is taking me to the 3rd century BC. This spring is one of the three main headwaters of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is comprised mainly of three headwaters. On the east is Hermon, in the center, it's Dan, and on the west is Chatzbani. And the three of them eventually merge into one river that flows down south and enters into the Sea of Galilee, and then leaves the Sea of Galilee in the southern part of it and flows all the way to its dead end at the Dead Sea. It is right there where the River Jordan almost entered the Dead Sea that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. However, it is right here where the spring comes out of the foothills of Mount Hermon, where Jesus, according to Matthew chapter 16, asked the famous question, who do men say that I am? Now allow me also to say that in the third century, the Greek occupation of this land began with Alexander the Great. And when they arrived in this majestic and beautiful place, they were fascinated not only by the spring and the massive rock behind us, but with the cave that you see right behind me that was actually a natural one, part of the karst phenomena I just referred to earlier. This natural cave at that time was a little different than today because the spring used to flow from within the cave. From the mouth of the cave came water and they continued flowing all the way down south. So in a beautiful lush and green area, there is a massive rock which is part of Mount Hermon. There is a natural cave 
and there is a wonderful, very lively spring that flows right out of it. And the Greek decided that this is the proper place to worship the God of the shepherds and the caves, Pan. Pan was actually half a man and half a goat. And the goat motif in the pagan worship is something that went all the way back even to the times of the book of Leviticus. People used to worship images or living goats as if they are form of deity. And by the way, that is exactly why in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 7, the Bible says, they shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons, and in the Hebrew, seirim, which is goats, after whom they have played the harlot. They shall be a statue forever for them throughout their generation. It's very interesting that in Leviticus, we see the connection between the worship of goats and sexual immorality. And this is exactly what we also found here. Remains of temples of dancing goats, remains of the temple of nymphs, virgins that used to be worshipped here, and the place of the worship of the goddess of luck. And all of that formed probably the largest pagan worship complex in the land of Israel. A place that Jewish people often refrain from visit. And this is exactly why I believe it's important that we deal with Matthew 16 and with what Jesus was asking. Because in the context of the Jewish view of this place as a satanic place and of the cave as a dwelling place of Satan, you know, Jewish people truly thought that this cave leads you to the gates of hell. And having said that, now you may understand why is it that Jesus mentioned that phrase in his answer to his disciples. I would like to read from Matthew 16 from verse 13 to verse 23. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Messiah, the Christ, Christos, anointed one, the Son of the living God. Now make no mistake, Jewish people never ever taught in any of their schools or synagogues that the Messiah is the Son of God. That explains what Jesus answered and he said, Blessed are you Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. No one taught you that, no rabbi, no teacher, no one even understands what you just said. This is the things of God. You just spoke something that only God could reveal to you. And that's why he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What an amazing compliment Peter just got from Jesus. You just spoke the words of God, from God, about God. And he also said this to Peter. I also say to you that you are Peter, in the Greek, Petros, little pebble, little stone. And on this rock, and in the Greek, Petra, and I'm thinking, Petra, by the way, is a massive rock. Obviously, he's not talking about Peter, who is a small rock. He's referring to this massive rock behind me, part of Mount Hermon, where the cave is. And look what he says. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he commanded 
Watch this. He commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, do you understand what I just said? Jesus commanded his disciples, since you know I'm the Messiah, and since you may understand what Messiah is all about, tell no one. Because Jesus understands, by the way, the world is not expecting a suffering Messiah. The world is expecting a ruling and reigning one. And if you tell them now that I'm the one, they will actually get the wrong picture. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he, watch this, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. From that point, Jesus began to share with his disciples what must happen to him, not may happen, could happen, possibly, maybe, could be, no, no. What must happen, and you know that, every time we hear about the term must, it is related to as it is written, because it is written, I came to fulfill that which is written. And look what happened. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The same Peter who just acknowledged that Jesus is A, the Messiah, and B, not just a man who is anointed, the Son of the living God. The same one who had a revelation that could only come from God the Father is now taking the Son of God, the Messiah, and is rebuking him, saying to him, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. <laughs> Peter basically tells Jesus, Don't tell us that you're going to Jerusalem to be delivered to the hands of the priest and to be crucified and to resurrect. Don't tell us those things. Far be it from you. This shall not happen to you. Isn't that interesting? The very reason Jesus came to the world is now that which Peter is resisting. And this is exactly why at this point, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. The same Jesus who gave praises and compliments to Peter just a minute earlier is now looking at the face of Peter, but he's not talking to Peter. He's talking to the one who filled Peter's head with all of these ideas, with that notion that his suffering, his death, and his resurrection are not even needed. The very fact that Peter rebuked Jesus for saying that he is about to go to Jerusalem, be delivered to the hands of the priests and the Pharisees, that he is going to be crucified, he is going to be buried and then resurrect. All of that made Peter very angry, very uncomfortable. In other words, I do not want you to speak like that. That's not the type of things we need to hear and we want to hear and we should hear from our Messiah. You see, in that mindset of Peter, Jesus has to come riding a horse, entering into Jerusalem, declare himself as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and thus the Messianic Kingdom begins. However, it's very convenient to only look for that return of Jesus. But what about the original reason for which he came. Jesus had to address the false Jewish perception of the Messiah. You must understand that the Messianic aspirations are a very central thing in the Jewish faith. It's not like they don't believe in the Messiah. They don't believe in his coming. No, they actually still wait for the Messiah. But the problem of the Jewish religion, and I'm, I'm saying religion because this is obviously something that is not scriptural. The problem is that they missed the connection between sin 
and the Messiah. And this is precisely the scheme of the devil. The Jewish people became focused on the things of men in order to become righteous. They became religious. They looked at the law as a way for them to become self-righteous. And this is exactly why Isaiah the prophet in chapter 1 verses 12 to 20 says, When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand? To trample my courts, bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. Isaiah says, God is actually speaking to the nation of Israel. All your religious activity, your religious ceremonies, incense and prayers and lifting up your hands. This is an abomination to me. I don't want it. Look what he says, the new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assembly. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. God, who commanded Israel to celebrate the Sabbath and the festivals, is telling the people of Israel, I hate what you turn it into. I am weary of bearing them, he said. They are a trouble to me. I remember reading the first chapter of Isaiah, I almost passed out. I, om I couldn't believe how much God is against religion in general and what the Jewish people turn the commandments of God into. And then he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doing from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow, and then he says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, God basically says, as long as you have the problem of sin, and as long as you do not address it, and as long as you continue with your evil ways, coming to the synagogue on Saturday, keeping the Sabbath, celebrating the holidays, all of that means nothing to me. Isaiah 59 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The sin is the problem of man. And unless you address that, and unless you bring a solution for that, there is no way you can continue sailing in your imagination about the Messiah that will come as a king that will reign and rule and bring peace and prosperity. No, sin has to be dealt first with. The first coming was not about to reign and rule. The first coming was about to save us from our sins. And for that, there has to be bloodshed, there has to be atoning death, there has to be death and indeed resurrection. Even the death was not enough. Israel were attempting to avoid sin by keeping the law, which only led to more hypocrisy. Furthermore, the law was designed to not deal with the sin, but to expose their sin and their need for the Messiah. Remember the woman that was caught in adultery. Remember how everybody was were ready to pick up the stone and stone her to death according to the law. But look what Jesus says. When they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. He basically said, you're all hypocrites. You want to kill her for her sin without acknowledging of your own. In Galatians 3.24, it says, Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to the Messiah, that we might be justified by faith, not by keeping any law, not by religion, by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. A born-again, spirit-filled person, whether Jew or Gentile, is no longer under the law. The law was there to expose your sin. Messiah came to take them away.
The Old Testament, unlike the Jewish religion, connected sin to the need for the Messiah from the very beginning. And this is exactly why Isaiah was so frustrated. Well, the Lord was frustrated through the mouth of Isaiah when he said that they honor me with their lips, but with their heart, they're actually far from me because they teach man's doctrines and not the word of God. Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Without blood, there's no life. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. If you committed sin, if your soul is stained, if you need atonement, guess what? According to the word of God, it is the blood that has to be shed for the atonement of sin. Because in that blood, there is life. The Bible is very clear. You need blood for the atonement of sin. You need it to be of a perfect lamb. But you also know that there has to be suffering. There has to be death. There has to be resurrection. All of that is not the idea of some Christians taken from New Testament only. This is deeply embedded in the Old Testament and the Jewish people of all should have known it. This notion that there has to be a Messiah that will suffer, that will die, and that will resurrect is not a Christian idea born out of the New Testament that is for the Gentiles. Let me make it very clear. The New Testament was given to Israel. And let me make it clear, throughout the entire Old Testament, we see scriptures telling us not only about the glorious reigning of the Messiah, but about His suffering, about His death, and about His resurrection. Look, for example, about His suffering, Psalm 22, verse 15 to 16, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cling to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. If that's not a description of the crucifixion, then I don't know what it is. And then it says in Psalm 38, those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speaks of destruction and plan deception all day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. And I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. Thus, I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth is no response. Even Isaiah chapter 53, that very chapter that led me to the Lord says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions, and He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. Not only his suffering, not only his bruises, not only his chastisement, even his death is prophesied in the Old Testament. Psalm 31 verse 5, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. I commit my spirit. I'm about to die. I'm dying. Psalm 69 21, They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Daniel 9.26 the book of Daniel, in that amazing 70 weeks uh, prophecy, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Messiah will be killed and not for anything that he did wrong. Even Daniel said that. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. In other words, the death of the Messiah for our sins, not for His, for our guilt, not for His, will happen before Jerusalem will fall and the temple will be destroyed by a great nation, the Roman Empire. And if you think that the suffering and the death are where the Old Testament stops, you're wrong. Even the very resurrection of the Messiah was prophesied in the Old Testament. Job chapter 19, 
23 to 27. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh, I shall see God whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another how my heart yearns within me. Psalm 16 verses 9 to 11. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Sheol nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. He is not going to stay dead. He will not see corruption. You will not allow your Holy One, Kedosh Israel, the Holy One of Israel. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy and your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 118 verses 17 to 18. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Death will not keep you there. Life has to come. Isaiah 25, seven to eight. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, the rebuke of his people, and he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. He will swallow up death forever. His death is death, but the resurrection is when death was no longer having any effect. It was swallowed up forever. That is exactly after we have seen in the Old Testament and mostly in the books of the prophets. This is exactly why Jesus appeared before the two disciples, his own disciples who followed him for three years, right after his death and resurrection. On Sunday morning, they left Jerusalem. They heard that he is no longer in the grave. They heard that the women found the grave empty. They heard that the angels said that he is alive. Do you think that they rejoiced? Do you think that they stayed in Jerusalem to celebrate? Absolutely not. They actually left Jerusalem on the way out to Emmaus. They walked and they talked and they were angry, very confused, embarrassed. And of all things, they were sad. Can you imagine? They were sad. And this is exactly why Jesus appeared. And then he heard, he asked, what are those things that you talk about? What kind of conversation is this from Luke 24 that you have with one another as you walk and you are so sad, Jesus asked him. And then the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And look, they're now using past tense. Who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all people? And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Look, they're so sad, they're angry, they're confused, they're embarrassed. Their Messiah, their King was actually delivered as the greatest criminal to the hands of the priests and the rulers and he was condemned to death and he was crucified. Crucifixion was left to the worst of the worst. But we were hoping, we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. They gave up. They could not even comprehend the fact that their Messiah, the one whom they followed for the last three years, is going to resurrect. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find the body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. 
And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, Jesus looked at them. They just confessed. The angel said he's alive. The tomb is empty. We verified it. And instead of understanding that this is the most amazing thing ever, they were sad. And that is why Jesus said, O oh, foolish ones. He's not saying that to the priests. He's not saying that to the Pharisees. He's not saying that to the rabbis. He's not saying that to the Romans. He's saying that to his own disciples. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. You know it, but you don't believe it. And then he said, Ought not the Christ, the Messiah, to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Haven't you read the book of Psalms and the books of the prophets. Haven't you read Isaiah chapter 53? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures. All the scriptures in that time was just the Old Testament. The New Testament was not written yet. He expounded to them in all scriptures the things concerning himself. The gap between the Jewish religion, the Jewish concept of Messiah, and the Bible, the Word of God, the Scripture, was so big that even his own disciples, who followed him for the last three years, who, who've seen unbelievable amount of miracles performed by him, who know they've been here, they heard Peter saying, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He shared with them right here what his end is going to be. His own disciples were so captured in that concept of there's only one Messiah. He's going to come and rule and reign. He's going to bring peace and prosperity. And we will be once again a nation not under any occupation. But they skipped the point that Messiah first had to come to deal with the sin of man. And their eyes were open only when they realized as he broke the bread, they probably, he was actually pierced. See, Satan was seeking to prevent the resurrection. Let me make it very clear. From the very beginning, Satan was on the defense. From the book of Genesis, we can see that from the very third chapter, we see that. We should not be surprised because Satan has been determined to destroy the seed, the seed of the woman, remember, which is the Messiah, since the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3.15, the first ever prophecy given in the entire Bible was actually to Satan, to the serpent, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. By the way, women don't have seed, last time I heard, unless it's a seed in a woman that was not coming from a man. Not now the seed of the woman. He shall bruise your head. He's going to crush you. You shall just bruise his heel. You see, Satan understands there has to be a seed of a woman that is going to eventually crush my head. And so what is he doing? He's looking all around to see how can I somehow prevent that from happening. And this is exactly the next chapter in Genesis 4. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. The first murder in the Bible was a chapter later. Satan already started with his tactics. Let's kill, destroy, accuse. I have to kill the one that is the good guy here because he might be the one. This might be the one that is going to kill me. Of course, he never thought that there's going to be a third son of Adam and Eve, and it is Seth. He did not take that one in the account. Exodus 1, 15 to 16. Remember, Pharaoh and the Hebrew babies. When Satan realized, okay, he probably has to come from the nation of Israel. Let's kill all the babies. And then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other one Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew woman and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, remember, he knows it's a seed. When it's a son, 
then you shall kill him. If it is a daughter, then she shall live. There has to be a male that will bring forth not only salvation to the world, but also end of sin and end of Satan. And it's interesting because in Esther chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, you can see another attempt to kill all the Jews, Haman. When Haman saw that Mordechai did not bow to pay his homage, Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordechai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordechai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Achashverosh, the people of Mordechai. It wasn't only Haman. What about Herod? In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 2, then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who are in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. He heard Messiah was born. He heard it's a male. He heard it's in around Bethlehem. So what are we going to do? Kill all the babies from two years and under. Satan didn't want Jesus to even be born. And when Jesus was born, he didn't want him to live. As Jesus began his ministry, right when John baptized him, the next thing, he tried to recruit him. I will give you all these things if you will be on my side and worship me. Matthew 26, verse 31, Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. If I'm gonna bring an end to this ministry, the sheep will be scattered and this will be the end of this newborn faith called Christianity. If it's only about this life, and if there is nothing about the resurrection, then what happened? I want to tell you that the atoning death of Jesus will not come into effect without the resurrection. If he only stayed dead and did not resurrect, we're still dead in our sins. The resurrection is the key to the concept of the death. The goat or lamb never resurrected. Throughout the Old Testament, when they killed the goat, or they killed the lamb, or they killed any animal for atonement, it never resurrected. The resurrection took away our sins forever. Animal could not do that. This is why in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, it says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. You can run away from this truth as much as you want. He had to be crucified. He had to be resurrected. It's not just the coming of a king to reign and rule. That will happen in his second coming. Messiah had to be crucified. In fact, that's the key to my salvation and yours. Paul said, I could have come and given you excellent speeches, high words. I could have given you false hopes that you are wonderful, that you are great, that all you need is to wait for the reigning Messiah. No. The one thing I know that I had to come and tell you and preach is Him crucified. 
the crucifixion is necessity. It is super important. If there's one thing I want to deliver today in this message is this. The suffering, the crucifixion, the death and the resurrection are scriptural, are biblical, are super Jewish, and they are super essential for the salvation. And if you think that Jesus can come and reign as a Messiah and reign as a king and bring an end to the Roman rule, and that's it. If you shove aside the whole aspect of sin, if you ignore the whole idea that sin separates us from God, there's no way anyone can come and reign and bring peace and prosperity and usher a messianic era without having the sin issue first dealt with. This is the biblical perception of the Messiah, that he had to come, that he had to suffer, that he had to die, that he had perfect life without sin, but then he was killed for something he never did. And then of course, he resurrected. We are responsible to know who Jesus is because of what the Word of God says about him. Not man, the Word of God, not books, not the world, not scholars, not some beautiful lecturers, not theologians, what the Word of God says. The resurrection declares our victory over death, and it's important. In 1 Corinthians 15, O oh death, where is your sting? Or Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The last point I want to mention is that the resurrection initiates our departure from this world to our heavenly home. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the journey out of here begins with our life here. We're called out of darkness and then until that departure physically, we have a job. 2 Corinthians 5, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What is an ambassador? Someone who is a resident and a citizen of a different country. And he's being sent on behalf of his country to another country, but to represent his own country. Now, as we are here, we are the ambassadors of Christ, which means we belong to him. We have heavenly citizenship, the Bible says. And we are now here in this world on his behalf, representing him, his ambassadors, for one and one only reason, to implore people to be reconciled. This is the ministry of the believer. This is the mission of the believer. This is the purpose of the believer, is to live his life now until God is taking him out of here with one goal, to plead people to be reconciled to God through Christ himself, the way we were. But the Bible also says in Romans 8, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. While we are here imploring people to be reconciled to God, we also have to have that heart that is eagerly waiting for the redemption of this body. What is the redemption of this body. The redemption of this body, as in 1 
Corinthians 15 is when the body will change and we will leave this place to be with the Lord. It has to be very, very, very clear that the purpose of the believer is all driven out of the fact that Christ suffered, was crucified, died and resurrected. And that resurrection enact his death and gives us the atonement, the forgiveness, the new life. His departure is the way for the Holy Spirit to come and be in us and enable us to be the ambassadors of Christ for one and one only reason is to implore people to be reconciled. Now, I want to tell you something and I want to conclude this message with this. When Jesus looked at Peter, after Peter rebuked him not to talk about suffering, about death and about resurrection, Jesus looked at him and he could clearly see that Satan is speaking. And what did he say? Get behind me, go away. These are not the things of God. These are the things of men. Get behind me because I'm here for a reason. Jesus said, it's my choice. It's not circumstances. It's not an accident. If you don't understand that Messiah came for you to suffer for you instead of you, to die for you instead of you, and to be the first fruit of the resurrection that will mark your future resurrection in the rapture when it comes, then you missed out the whole message of God. And then if any other message is being preached to you, it's a message of the doctrines of men and not the doctrines of God. God loves you. God sent His Son to die for you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God turned His head, turned His face away. So He who knew no sin will become sin. So we will become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God bless you.